there's always been a tendency to politicize art. I mean, that goes back hundreds of years, but now it's no longer politicizing art. <coughs> the art becomes entirely subordinate to the identity of the artist. The, the British Museum returned an Inuit ghost shirt to Nunavut in Canada. Nunavut is a province where 50,000 people visit Nunavut each year. Not the museum, the whole province. The British Museum has 50,000 people going through its doors every three days. And what you see is that now, effectively no one can share an understanding of this cultural artifact. And the, the, the dynamic is always, in my opinion, largely driven by a crisis of insecurity here rather than demands elsewhere. I was myself in a board of directors of a small museum in Antwerp. And in order to keep our funding from the local government, from the regional government, we had to basically show what we do to be more inclusive, how to get more people to come to our museum or see our exhibitions that would otherwise not come to our exhibitions, my, people with a migration background. I mean, we were dealing with um, veterans of the First World War and their heritage, so not something that maybe a lot of migrant people are interested in. But we had to show that we do that. And I also, I, it's for museums, it's also very important that in, in order to keep their funding, the laws, laws are such that they have to take into account this inclusivity, not buying ivory art, restitution, saying something about inclusive, inclusivity of, uh, of, uh, of people with migration background or, with or, or gender issues. So they need to tick these boxes for the governments in order to keep getting their funding. So I think what we should be talking about here, especially in the context that we are in Brussels and the European Union, is this kind of, rather than a kind of rather ideological uh, line set by uh, the elites that are within the art movement or that um, govern the museums, it's rather the regulations that of which the funding is dependent. So I think the, the discussion on ESG and how ESG is centralizing how we vision, uh, envision art, I think that's a discussion that we should be having. Yeah. Yeah, sensitivity reading, just uh, for a moment to spend some time with that, is, is, uh, is uh, actually also an opening to a little bit uh, fun because uh, uh, what they do is, uh, is so extreme. So they had this um, big uh, exhibition of Emil Nolde, who had a dubious political past. And um, they wanted to write that he was a lighthouse in his age, a light tower. And uh, the sensitivity reader said, no, 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 that's, that's not possible. Because the light is white and the night is black. So it's already. <laughs> Problematic. Yeah. Yeah. So he was not, they were not allowed to use that. Uh, the first issue is this rewriting of history. I'm not sure whether it is correct to have so well emphatic feelings about rewriting history. It's outrageous if you do so, because history has been rewritten all the time. In the 19th century, uh, an Italian historian, Benedetto Croce, even said each generation has to rewrite its own history because each generation faces new challenges, has new ideas, and therefore the past looks differently in the light of a, of a new era. So this is nothing, nothing extraordinary. Look at professional historians. They have had their linguistic turn, their iconic turn, their spatial turn, they have had their Marxist turns before, and so on. Nobody knows what the next turn will be. All of this can enrich our vision, our knowledge of history. Therefore, it seems really to be a sign of weakness if you feel threatened by attempts at rewriting history. Maybe all our, well, concerns and fears for history being rewritten are only a symptom of our intellectual and emotional and cultural weakness. Therefore, we should not engage so much in, in complaining about these attempts at rewriting history. We should invest more in integrating those alternatives or complementary views. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that Werner said what he said, because I, I think the very opposite. <laughs> uh, and also, what you said earlier on, I don't know your name, uh, because I don't think what we're seeing is either the rewriting or the reinterpreting history, which is a legitimate enterprise. I'm a big believer in rewriting history, and I'm a big believer in, in reinterpreting history. But what we're seeing now is something very different, because when you uh, sort of essentially, uncritically, recast history as this <coughs> history of shame, then you're not interested in any individual events, you're not interested in any battles or what any specific individual has done, 
all you're interested in is just finding damage, contaminating it. And it's very interesting because if you compare this new version of the past, because it's really a war against the past, that's what we're talking about. The war against the past today is different than when the Stalinist regimes went about it. For example, the Stalinist regimes, when they rewrote history, they didn't make Spartacus you know, and his rebellion in Rome out to be uh, a communist commissar. Right? They didn't actually attribute uh, communist ideology to a Roman rebellion. The war against the past is very different. They discover queer people in worlds where nobody was queer, where, the, where there was no gender concept. So, you know, today what they're doing is they're fantasizing in a narcissistic mode about projecting onto the past their own uh, obsession. And that's, very, that's a very entirely destructive process because they're not really interested in the profession of history, they're not interested in the ideological side of it. They are merely contaminating something that they see as being uh, the enemy. And that's why I ju just finished writing this book called The War Against the Past. And what I'm really doing in this book is to explain the uniqueness of the way in which uh, our traditions, our past are, are treated because it's no longer about projecting an ideology on it because they don't have an ideology. I mean, woke people, identity political people, they haven't got a, a clear dogma or ideology, but what they have is a sensibility of shame and hatred. For, for what it is, and that is why we, when you said we're pissing on ourselves or spitting on ourselves, the same thing. It, it is actually a, a very powerful impulse that you notice within particularly the Anglo-American world, and it is something that was not gonna go away now because it's now infected four generations of people who've grown up with this kind of hatred for themselves. And I think that's really what we are yep. really looking at rather than a historical issue that's to do with professional history. Uh, well, Frank spoke at great length. It's great that we can have a debate at MCC events. I was uh, also wanting to disagree with my colleague, Werner, um, but just on one, uh, on one small other point, because when you look at all of these contemporary trends, uh, yes, you can f try and find other perspectives, but for the young people, and increasingly older people, because this has been around for a long time, it becomes very, very difficult to have a sense of the past because you're projecting all the contemporary tr trends into the past. So for young people uh, trying to learn anything from a museum and looking at uh, the exhibits, actually they're seeing the contemporary trends uh, projected back into the past as if that's how it's always been. My feeling is that what we call politicization of museums is only the secondary phenomenon. The first, the primary phenomenon is a problem which cannot be solved by any means. This is the education function of museums. Museums, since the 19th century, are there for education. No. So to Werner, about museums' educational role, I, don't, I do not agree uh, about that museums should educate. I think museums, they should ma mediate, transmit uh, their subject matter. It can be history, cultural history, it can be science. Uh, on the basis uh, of, a, of a qualified scholarly work and in an intelligible manner and also entertaining, of course, because they need public, they need also young people. But uh, uh, as a, the educational role is a mission and I'm very much, again, museums as a, um, the mission-driven museums. 